The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to Evangelical United Methodist Church. I'm Andrew Bird Harris. I'm the pastor here. It's so good to see all of you on this third Sunday in the season of Easter. And I want to highlight that it's the season of Easter because here in the season of Easter, we're going to try to have an Easter hymn every Sunday. And you might be like wondering why. Because there is Easter Day, but there's also the season of Easter. And I, I really want to hit that home this year. Uh, so we're going to make sure that during our worship in the season of Easter, that we just remind ourselves that we're celebrating the resurrection. We're celebrating uh, the, the, the new life we find in Jesus. We are uh, thankful for all of you who are worshiping with us online this morning. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online this morning, we'd love to know that you're worshiping with us online. There's a link that you can click on before, during, after the worship service to, to share who's worshiping with you, to share joys or concerns, to give us feedback. Uh, I'm very thankful one of you on Easter Day sent a very lovely, encouraging uh, response, and we just love to know that people are worshiping with us. Today is not only the third Sunday in the season, uh, or second, is it second Sunday? All right, anyway. Uh, I have in my notes the second, but, but this is Oh, the Easter day always confuses me. Uh, but anyway, we're in the season of Easter. It's also Native American Ministries Sunday, which is a special Sunday in the United Methodist Church. Yeah, I think I got my notes wrong. I don't know why. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, Native American Ministries Sunday in the United Methodist Church. We'll talk more about that during the offering. And today we start a sermon series on forgiveness. And can we be forgiven? And, and, and what does that mean? There are many announcements in your bulletin. I, we just keep asking Marianne to, to, to cut up more trees and to, to, to print more paper, but they're all important, so I do want to highlight some of them. Uh, the first is our calendar. You'll notice that today is a cookie fellowship, so we invite you to come after, uh, after worship downstairs to, to join us for a time of fellowship and cookies, and so we just invite you to stay after worship for that. My Bible study on the book of Romans continues on Monday night. If you've not been part of it before, you're welcome to come. We're only in week two, and we're looking at the second part of Romans and trying to understand how Paul wrestles with salvation and our relationship with God. Tuesday, we have prayer shawl ministry, and also we have a mission and vision meeting, which is related to this insert in the bulletin. Uh, we, we have a mission and vision statement, but now we're trying to figure out what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we live into it? And so I invite you to <clears throat> join us on Tuesday night. And if you've never been part of these meetings before and would like some background information, you can go to our website. I have a link there. All of our previous meetings are on video there. All of the previous handouts, all of the previous PowerPoints are on there. You're welcome to, to look at those before the meeting. But also I have reflection questions on the back of that insert, and that's what we're going to wrestle with, those reflection questions. How do we live into our mission and vision statement? This Saturday is our next community dinner, and I'm going to, once I'm done with the announcements, invite Lori to come up because she has a, a request for all of you for that. But we invite you to come out to join us. They are excellent, and they've been really well attended. So if you're going to come, we invite you to come early so that you make sure you get food. Because if you wait till, till 6 o'clock, who knows? It, it, it may be out. So we just uh, are inviting you to come for the dinner. Uh, if you'd like to help, show up what, around 4 o'clock. Uh, we can always use more help uh, at the dinners, but I'm thankful for all of you who do help. You'll see that the Mission and Care Committee is uh, taking up a collection for the Humane Society. That's also related to a bulletin that, or insert in your bulletin as well. Uh, I, I was intrigued that the young and young at heart class are making dog biscuits. Uh, that, that's, <laughs> that, that, that might be a little interesting when we walk in on Sunday morning and smell the dog biscuits. You'll see that for annual conference, we are collecting uh, hand towels. And the reason we're collecting hand towels is that we're trying to encourage all the churches in the conference to bring something to annual conference to make uh, care kits uh, for people who need uh, I, I, I'm not sure what the care kits are used for exactly. I think they're for people that just need some personal hygiene items and stuff in, in a particular situation. Our job in making the care kits is to bring in towels. We have a Mission Central box downstairs, and if you put those in the Mission Central box downstairs, I will bring them to annual conference 
uh, in the end of May. We're still inviting people to send cards to Braden, and his address and information is there in the bulletin. General Conference is coming up, and that's what this insert in your bulletin is for. And it's just going to invite you to pray, both for the people who are going, for the whole team that puts General Conference together, the bishops, the legislation. We'll talk more about General Conference as we get closer to it, but I just wanted to invite us to start praying for the people that we as a conference are sending to General Conference. We are doing what we did last year for Pentecost, collecting money for red flowers, and we're going to have the red flowers up front on Pentecost, and then we're going to put them outside in our flower gardens uh, after Pentecost Sunday uh, just to help decorate the church and also to help celebrate Pentecost as well. Those are a lot of announcements. I think I covered most of the announcements that are in your bulletin. Uh, Lori, would you like to share? Good morning. I just want to second what Pastor Andrew had said, that we could always use more help, more hands, make lighter work. So um, show up at 4 o'clock, and we're usually done by 6.30 out of there. So a couple hours, you'll get a free meal out of it, whether you want to work in the kitchen or work out in the dining room. Um, we certainly would appreciate that. But I'm here again to ask, since it's our turkey dinner this week, I have our loaves of bread downstairs. So if anybody's willing to take a couple loaves home, cut them up for us so that they're ready for the stuffing, um, we would appreciate that. So see me downstairs after the service. Thank you. I don't know about all of you, but April has seemed so busy. There's just so much going on and so many different things calling my attention, I imagine your attention. In the midst of the busyness and the craziness of this moment, I invite us to pause and let's turn our hearts and our minds towards the worship of God.
Greetings and peace to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Deacon Megan Bird Harris. Please rise as you are able for directing our intention toward God. The one whose wrongdoing is forgiven, whose sin is covered over, is truly truly happy. happy. The one the Lord doesn't consider guilty, in whose spirit there is no dishonesty, that one is truly happy. You who are righteous, rejoice in the Lord and be glad. All you whose hearts are right, sing out in joy. Please join with me in our hymn of praise, Easter people, raise your voices. <laughs> going to enter a time of prayer. And as we enter this time of prayer, I invite you to share your joys, your praises, your thanksgivings, your concerns, and your challenges. Stephen's coming around with a microphone. We invite you to raise your hand if you have something you'd like to share. Just a reminder, we're on the radio and this is being live streamed. So we invite you to share things that that can be widely known. And we invite you to use first names. Um, I just want to thank everybody for their prayers for me um, last week. Um, thank you. They they worked. I am feeling much better. Um, I did get some very devastating news Friday evening. My dad has been diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer. It is very aggressive. 
and he um, more, will more likely need to do chemotherapy. Um, I don't know what more testing will be done, and I will find out more today. Um, but please keep me and my family in your prayers. And we definitely can do that, Bobby Joe. Are there others? I, I have a, a joy. Uh, Deacon Megan and I were able to go up to my, my, my uh, dad's house uh, yesterday. I have a new niece, uh, so we got to meet Peyton. And then we also got to see my most of my brothers. One brother, his, his kids were sick, so they weren't able to come. But I was able to see a lot of my family yesterday, and I got to meet my new niece, Peyton. And uh, so that's, that's, that's a joy. I'm going to invite you to raise your hand if you have uh, an unspoken prayer concern this morning. There are things that we can share out loud. There are things sometimes that we can't, but we can always turn to God in prayer. Today for our prayer time, we're going to have intercessory prayer. And so Deacon Megan and I will be offering a series of intercessions. And then there's not any response. We just invite you to pray pause, and to have silent prayer between the different intercessions. Let us pray. With all the faithful, let us pray to the Lord who is our hiding place in times of trouble, who surrounds us with glad cries of deliverance. We pray for all who are hungry, whether hungry for power and glory or hungry for a simple meal. Show the mighty that you alone can satisfy their deepest need and feed the poor from the abundance of your good creation. We pray for the church in times of trial, whether tested by temptuous change or tempted by safety of the status quo. Give us peace when anger and fear threaten to divide us and challenge us when we are too comfortable in this world. We pray for leaders in high places, whether determined to help those who suffer or distant from the cries of the oppressed. Open their eyes to see your saving power at work and open their ears to hear your prophet's call for justice. Lord God, instruct us in the way we should go and let your steadfast love surround us always. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And he said to them, 
All these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you will die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like that when you eat of your eyes will be opened. You'll be like that of God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some of to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and the woman hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to with me, she gave me the fruits from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will pour an enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is God's word for everyone. I'd like to invite the children to come up for our children's lesson. Good morning. How are you guys today? Good. Um, so if I said the word tempted or temptation, do you guys know what that means? We say it a lot. Do you know what that means? Um, it is if it, I found it, I don't want to do it. And, and, and it was a and, and it Oh, that might be something that you would be tempted to do. Yeah, but do you know what it means? Like, he gave an example. Do you know what it, like... It's, we can give examples of it. So tempted is like when I really, really want to do something, but I know that I shouldn't do it, right? Like if mom said no more snacks, no more treats, but like mom's doing laundry and like the candy jars right there, I might feel really tempted. Like no one would know if I just took some or ate some cookies or got in the pantry and got snacks I was supposed to have. I want to, but I know like in my brain, in my heart that like I shouldn't do that. That's what tempted means. Um, so I was tempted once. I mean, I was tempted a lot more than, more than once, but um, our church, you know the big Halloween parade? 
we have here. So my grandpa used to live across the street, and we would always sit and watch. And um, if you don't know this about me, I really like to eat candy. Like, I eat a lot of candy, more than an adult should. Um, and so my mom said, no more candy. And so my mom wasn't looking, and I was like maybe Harper's age. Um, and I said, well, mom doesn't know. I'm going to just sneak one more. Nope, I'm putting the microphone. Thank you. Um, and so I popped it in my mouth. And right as I did that, my mom looked at me. And I went, oh! what do you think happened to the candy when I went, oh! I didn't swallow it. I started to choke on it. I was going, ah, so then my uncle had to get the mint out of my mouth. But I learned that I should have just listened to my mommy in the first place, and I should not have been tempted to sneak that one more piece of candy. And the whole point of being tempted and temptation is, is hard because a lot of times no one knows, right? When your teacher's looking away and you, it's easy for you to just copy the answers off their desk or look at your neighbor's paper, right? When, when mom tells you not to do something or dad tells you not to do something and then they kind of walk away, it's easy to do it, right? Because nobody's there. Nobody would know. Who would know, though? Maybe mom would. Who's, who would know? Who is watching and could see? Yeah, he would know, right? God would know. And in our heart, we know what's right and what's wrong, right? And we use that word temptation in a prayer, don't we? Every Sunday, we ask God to help us. We say, and lead us not into temptation. Yeah, you guys know that word. And so we're asking God for help because he knows it's hard. Even Jesus was tempted by the devil. The devil said, hey, throw yourself off this cliff and the angels will save you. But Jesus knew that God did not want him to do that. And the devil was trying to tempt him to do something that he shouldn't do. So when we pray that prayer, lead us not into temptation, we're saying, God, we know we're not strong. We know we need your help. Can you lead us in a different direction so we're not tempted to do bad things that you don't want us to do? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this week, when you feel tempted to sneak an extra treat or do something you're not supposed to do in school, see if we can remember that prayer and remember this little chat we're having today. And we're not going to do the Lord's Prayer now because we have communion, but we'll do that a little bit later. Okay? All right. Can we pray together, please? You'll be my echo, so you'll repeat after me. Dear God, please help us to not be tempted to make wrong choices. We know that you are on our side and you will lead us to make good choices. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maxwell, where'd you put your Bible? Wait, wait, my Bible! Go get it. Bible. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, as we meditate on your word and hear your word proclaimed, Open up our hearts, open up our minds, and let us hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. Amen. Today we start a new sermon series on forgiveness, and, and the reason I want to talk about forgiveness is because in the fall, I want to talk about forgiving other people. When I asked you all for ideas on what to preach on this year, someone wanted a, serv- a, a sermon series on forgiving. How do we forgive other people? But for us to forgive other people, we really need to think about, like, that we also need forgiveness, that we do things both in relationship to God and to each other that we need to be forgiven for. And it's helpful to forgive other people if we remember that we need to be forgiven. And it's, more easy, it's easier to be more gracious towards other people. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at what does it mean to be forgiven by God. I also wanted to talk about this because for years I've, I've taken it for granted that people know they can be forgiven. Like it just seems so obvious to me because I've been in the church my whole life, and it's been a message taught to me in multiple ways in multiple different channels. 
But, but one year when I was asking for ideas for sermons, someone said they wanted a sermon on forgiveness because they weren't sure God would forgive them for something they had done. And that I think there are a lot of us who sometimes carry weight or guilt about things. And sometimes maybe we internalize that we can't be forgiven. And so it's always helpful to be reminded that, that God will forgive. And that when we have issues with other people, there's things that we can do to help be forgiven and to receive forgiveness. And so that's what we're going to look at for the next few weeks. And the short of this all for the sermon today is why do we need forgiveness? And that's because sin. And, and sin makes relationships messy. Relationships, our relationship with God gets messy, and our relationship with each other gets messy. That we sometimes knowingly and unknowingly do things to hurt our relationship with God and with each other. And that sometimes in our silences and our words, we hurt our relationship with God or with each other. And all of us fall short of God's highest ambitions for our lives. I imagine you've had preachers talk to you about the Greek word for sin. It comes from archery, from missing the mark, that God has desires for us to, to achieve in life, and we often fall short of that mark because of sin. And, and as a pastor, I've just seen how oftentimes, like, Forgiveness is needed in context not where people intended to hurt other people, but that just sometimes we hurt each other. And, and, and in fact, like if I was going to make a list of all the different times as a pastor that I've hurt people and that I might need forgiveness for, like most of the time I didn't set out to hurt anyone. I didn't say, boy, how can I ruin this person's day today? Like usually I was doing what I thought was right. They were doing what they thought was right. And then when it came in conflict, we hurt each other in the process and, and I just know there's just so much hurt that people carry. Like, we have smiles on our faces on Sunday morning, but when I talk to people outside of Sunday morning, I just know that people are holding on to a lot of hurt and a lot of pain, that we hurt each other and we are hurt by each other intentionally and unintentionally. And, and sometimes it's minor. Uh, like, uh, when I was really little, I, my mom took me to this woman's house, and she had broken her arm. And my first comment to this woman was, boy, is your house messy. <laughs> and, and, and I wasn't trying to hurt her, but that was hurtful to her. Uh, my friends in college, I, I worked with two people in a cafeteria, and they got married. And they named their, their daughter Michaela. And I had never heard that name before. It was not as popular then as it is now. And I thought they were making a joke because he was always joking about what he was going to name his kids, and they were usually wrong, the names. Uh, he was not joking. It means gift from God. And, and it was really hurtful when I thought they were joking. Uh, <laughs> I was at one church, this was before I was a pastor, but Deacon Megan and I were in a young adult group, and they would always have like a little fellowship time after worship, and we were in the fellowship time. And, and, I, and I was joking about the building, because that building was an albatross around the church's neck. Like That church was really struggling, because that building was just too much church facility for that, that congregation. And I was just joking that it would be good to burn it all down and then start again. Well, someone I was joking with, her house had burned down as a child, and that was really hurtful for her. I wasn't trying to hurt her, but my, my joking about burning things down was really, really hurtful. I remember when I was in middle school, one of my friends had, had emigrated from the Soviet Union into the United States, and his dream was to be a doctor. His dream was to go to Harvard. And I just as a middle scorer, told him that was never going to happen uh, because I didn't think he was that smart. And, and that was really wrong. That was really, really wrong to do that to Andre. Like, that was just a terrible thing to do. But I've also hurt people in major ways. Like, I don't just hurt people in minor ways. I've hurt people in major ways. When I was in college, I was part of the radio station in college. I was one of the, the leaders of the radio station, but the person who was in charge of the radio station was doing a terrible job, and he was not doing what he was supposed to do. And the college administration told me that I, me and my friend had to get rid of him, that he had to step down. And so we tried to talk him into stepping down, and he refused. And then we had to decide, do we take his side or do we take the college's side? We chose the college's side, and that really hurt him deeply. We never reconciled after that. And, and I often wonder, like, was that the right thing to do? I mean, from the college's point of view, it was the right thing to do, but was it the right thing to do to hurt my friend that way? Uh, I've served churches where I've hurt people deeply, and I wasn't trying to, but, but there's been churches where we've tried to work out safe sanctuaries, 
and I thought we were on one page, and they were on a different page, and, and one time it got so ugly that the people left, and they wrote a really nasty letter, and they were really good people, but I hurt them deeply because we were not on the same page about safe sanctuaries. I could go on. I've hurt a lot of people deeply in a lot of different ways, and, and, and sometimes it's been intentional because I've been angry or hurt, and hurt people hurt people. Sometimes, most of the time, it's not intentional. I'm not trying to hurt people most of the time. I don't really like hurting people. I usually feel really bad. But, but as I said, relationships are messy. All of us have messy relationships that we hurt each other. We say insensitive things. We don't make time for each other. We prioritize people that uh, prioritize things over people, and sometimes that really hurts them. And our relationship with God is messy. That I found as a pastor that most people wish they had more time for God, that they wish they spent more time in relationship with God, but, but life's busy. There's things to clean, things to do, money to earn, children to watch. Like, you just get so busy, and sometimes, even though you would say God's your highest priority, like when you look at your time, you look at your energy, you look at your day, God's not your highest priority, and it's hard. And, and it can be really, really challenging. And when we read the Bible, we see that mess, mess, relationships are messy, and we see that the origin of the mess of our relationships is from almost the very beginning, and we see that here in chapter 3 of Genesis. Just to give a little bit of context for the part of Genesis we're in, there's two creation stories, if you've ever read Genesis. There's the first part from chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 4, and, and God creates humanity in there. And then you get the second part of chapter 2, and that God creates humanity again, and, and there's Adam and Eve. Although we don't actually know if, if Adam was called Adam, because the, the Hebrew word for man is Adam. So are they, is it just saying God created man, or did God create humans and call them man? Like, it's, it's not really clear that Adam is actually Adam. Uh, if we were studying this chapter, we, we could spend a whole lot more time on that. I mean, when, there's only one of you. Do you really need a name? Anyway, uh, <laughs> God knew who Adam was. So they're in this tree. They're in this paradise. God has created this beautiful, beautiful garden for, them to, for Adam to be in. And Adam has everything he needs except companionship. That God created us both to be in relationship with God, but also to be in relationship with other people. And Adam knows that he needs someone else, that he's lonely. I mean, he, he, he loves his time with God, but, but Adam needs someone else. And so God creates Eve, takes part of Adam, creates Eve, and then they're together, and things seem really, really good. God marries them. They're having a great time. And then we get into today's lesson. Uh, and, and, and there's a snake in the garden. And some of you hate snakes, so you're like, yep, it definitely would be a snake that would be in the garden. And if we were, getting in, if we were in a Bible study, we could talk about, well, is the snake Satan? And if the snake's Satan, is it Satan from the book of Job or Satan from the New Testament? Uh, we won't have to get into that much detail. For our purposes, the snake's not good. And for some of you, you'd say, yeah, no snake is good. I generally like them, but not when they're tempting me to do bad things. And so this snake asks Eve uh, to, to, like, did God say you can't eat the fruit in the garden? And he's like, oh, no, no, God said we can eat all the fruit except from, from the tree in the middle. Uh, and, and the snake's like, well, why can't you eat the, 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 tree, the fruit from the tree in the middle? And she's like, oh, because I die if I do that. And the snake's like, oh, no, no, you won't die. In fact, if you eat that fruit from the tree in the middle... Then, then you'll know stuff. You'll have wisdom. You'll have wisdom like God. And he's like, hmm, that fruit in the middle looks really good. And, and I would like to know more. I don't know a whole lot. And so she decides to eat it. And then Adam is right there the whole time. Like, it's very clear. It's not like Adam was off somewhere. Adam's right there. Adam hears the conversation. Eve offers the, the apple to Adam. I guess he's a coward because he, didn't want to, he wanted to see what happened to Eve first. Like, oh, well, she didn't die, so I'll eat it now. And, why did, he's there the whole time. He didn't just grab an apple for himself. He waits to see if she dies. She doesn't die. Then he eats the apple. And then suddenly they start blaming each other because they realize that this was a mistake. They're aware of good and evil. They're aware that they're naked. So they start putting clothes on. And they're aware that God is good. And maybe they're not so good. And maybe they don't want to be in God's presence anymore. But God created humanity to be in relationship with humanity. So God comes to Adam and Eve and he finds them hiding from him. And, and so... <laughs> he discovers that they've eaten that, that apple. And they don't die right away, but now they're cursed to die eventually. And, and, and so God puts a, a curse on them. God puts a curse on the snake. And they're banished from this beautiful paradise that was created for them. We're reading the book of Romans in my Bible study. And this is the moment the Apostle Paul says in Romans that sin entered the world, that sin 
entered humanity, and then we were now subject to death because of what happens here in the garden. And there's a lot of ways we could talk about it. There's a lot of different ways we could speculate on what was the exact sin that was committed in the garden, because there's a lot of different speculation about that. But what I want to talk about is a basic aspect of sin that we see in our story today, that it hurts relationships. It hurts Adam and Eve's relationship with each other, but even more importantly than that, it hurts the relationship of God, that their relationship of God is never the same because of the sin. Our relationship of God has been hurt and damaged because of the sin that they let enter into the world. Sin has devastating consequences, and sin acts in the world and acts on us and pushes us and causes us to do things we wouldn't want to do all the time. And, and, and so this leads me then to the main point of the sermon today, that sin hurts our relationship with God and hurts our relationships with each other. The man and the woman had a choice, and to quote one of my favorite movies, they chose poorly. Uh, and, and the reality is we all have choices, and, and I, I'm glad you're laughing, Stephen. I was thinking that you and Justin would be the ones that got that movie reference. It's, it's from uh, The Last Crusade, Indiana Jones. Uh, they have to choose which chalice to drink from. But all of us have many choices in life, uh, choices that help us love God and help us make our relationship with God better, choices that can help our relationships with each other, but we also have choices that can turn us away from God and turn us away from each other, and then sometimes it's, it's so bad that like, we have too many choices and we don't do anything. Like There's too much hurt in the world, and, and then we don't actually help anyone. There's too many people to be in relationship with, and so then we don't choose to be in relationship with any people. There's too many ways to act in love towards God, and we just choose not to act in love with God. That we often expa- experience like paralysis by analysis, as my, my one uh, teacher used to say. And, and that's why when I was trying to think of like, a sermon image to capture, like, how we often have so many choices that are so hard to make and not sure if we're going to help or hurt our relationships with each other. I I picked a maze and picked a maze like because like sometimes if you're in the middle of a maze, you really don't know like if I go this way, is it going to help or is it going to hurt? And if I go this way, what choices will I have? And if I go this way, I know I have different choices. And, And it can be really, really hard to navigate all the different choices that we have and that a lot of our hurt towards other people. A lot of the sin that we commit in the world towards God and each other is because we make bad choices. We make choices that hurt our relationships with other people. And, 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 and one of the weird things about making choices is that the more choices we have to make, the worse our choices get. Researchers tell us this. And our daily lives, we're confronted with so many choices. What time should I get up? Should I hit the snooze button? What should I wear? What should I eat? What should I do first? What should I do second? And like, Every day we are bombarded with so many different choices, and we don't often realize that this choice is either going to help or hurt our relationship with God, or that choice is going to help or hurt our relationship with someone else. But oftentimes, with all these different choices we're making, we are, are hurting other people, and we don't even realize that we're lost in a maze of possibilities, and oftentimes that maze takes us in bad directions. Now, to be fair, some of our choices are intentional. Sometimes we choose to hurt other people, that they hurt us, and we want to hurt them back. Sometimes even we choose to act in negative ways towards God because we get upset or angry at God, but but we also do that towards each other, that sometimes like someone says something mean to us, and then we want to say something mean to them, or that someone hurts us, and then we want to figure out how can we hurt that person, And, and sin is so at work in our lives. It pushes us and nudges us to hurt each other, and then as we're hurt, We want to hurt other people, and then they hurt other people, and it creates this vicious and nasty cycle of pain in the world. But it's also unintentional. A lot of times when we hurt other people or we hurt our relationship with God, it's not like we said, boy, today do I not want to be in a relationship with God, or boy, today do I want to hurt my best friend. But then we say something or do something, or we prioritize the wrong thing, or we react without thinking, and and, and we hurt each other, and we hurt our relationship with each other, and then what's even worse yet is sometimes we try to do good and, and, and it leads to people being hurt. It leads to sinful uh, behavior because sometimes we think we know best or sometimes we think we know what's best for someone else or sometimes we think we know the mind of God or that our goals and what we're trying to accomplish is more important than what someone else is trying to accomplish and we hurt people in the pursuit of those things that we're trying to do good. We're trying to do what we think is best and we hurt people in the way we often like laugh at the Pharisees in the Bible, but they really thought they were trying to do what was best. They really thought they were trying to help people even as they hurt people. Life is messy. 
Relationships are messy. Relationships are complicated. And then we're all so busy with, and we have so many different choices that we don't even realize sometimes how our choices are hurting our relationship with God and hurting our relationship with each other. But we have to be aware that sin is at work in our lives. Sin is at work in the world. And sin is inviting us and challenging us to hurt our relationship with God and hurt our relationship with each other. And it's only when we really take seriously that our choices have consequences, that sin is at work in the world, and that we need to try to seek in every decision God's will, what God desires, so that we can make less and less hurt in the world, that we're able to really start to to, to diminish the harm and sin that we release and unleash in the world. My invitation for us this week is to spend time each day in your prayer time Thinking about either, like, if you do it at night, what happened during the day, or if you do it in the morning, what you did the night before or the day before, and, and how did you help your relationship with God the, the previous day or that day? How did you hurt your relationship with God that day or the previous day? How did you help your relationship with other people, and how did you hurt? I think some of the biggest problems is that we don't even realize we're hurting each other because we're just so busy, and there's just so many choices, and life is so crazy. But sin hurts our relationship with God and each other. Amen. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, uh, today is a special Sunday in the United Methodist Church. It's Native American Ministry Sunday. And as we enter our time of offering this morning, one of the things I love about being United Methodist is that we're connectional. Uh, As my, my Sunday school class is looking at being United Methodist Christians, There are United Methodists around the world, and we're all trying to be in ministry together, and we're trying to support each other and help each other and connect to each other. And we have these special Sundays in the United Methodist Church where we collect money to help different special ministry situations. And one of our goals, one of our hopes as United Methodist Church is to help ministry among Native Americans. And so every year we collect money to go towards Native American ministry to help churches and communities that are Native American, to help future leaders uh, and, and help Native Americans become pastors. And and when we give on Sunday mornings, we are being a blessing to our Native American friends around the United States and help support their ministries and help connect to them. And and as United Methodists, we're better together and we can do more together. And that's why we have these special Sundays. If you'd like to give to this, there's special offering envelopes in the back. There's also the little card that's in your uh, bulletin with a QR code. But I just invite us to to, to support our brothers and sisters who are Native Americans in our connection. I invite us now to give God our praise as we join together in our doxology. offer to you, O God, the gifts of our hands and the loyalty of our hearts. Accept us with our gifts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. That was really beautiful. As we enter our time of Holy Communion this morning, Deacon Megan is going to lead us in a time of confession of our sins and words of pardon, and then she'll lead us into the first part of our great thanksgiving, and we'll pray together the great thanksgiving. All are welcome to the Lord's table who seek to grow in their relationship with God. Uh, if for any, well, if for any reason you can't take the bread cubes or the, the little cups of grape juice, we have gluten-free option uh, where you can ask for that. Or if you would prefer just a sealed package, you can have the gluten-free option. Uh, so we'll have one usher bringing around those, and then the other ushers will bring around the, the bread and the grape juice. We'll pass around the, grape or the bread first, and then as we partake of the, the, the bread together, we'll then pass around the grape juice and partake of the grape juice. Uh, I think those are all the instructions that I'd like to offer. Yeah. Happy are those whose sin is forgiven, who no longer suffer in silence but name their sin and seek God's grace. Let us confess our sin. Lord God, you know the ways of good and evil. You know the things that tempt us and the things that give life. You know our nakedness and you know our sin. We confess that we have disobeyed your word, denying your providence and care and relying on our own cleverness have mercy on us, and we pray. Cover us with your grace, feed us with the bread of life, and recreate us in your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Happy are those whose sin is forgiven. Be glad in the Lord and shout for joy. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed human beings from the dust of the ground and breathed life into us. You gave us a paradise in which to live, but we disobeyed you and discovered the difference between good and evil. Our eyes were opened to behold your glory, and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, yet he renounced all the efforts by the tempters to win him and his obedience. He died not for his sins, but for ours. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, 
to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. For as one man, sin came into the world. By one man, sin has been conquered. By your spirit, make us one of Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes again in final victory. And we feast at the heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit, and your Holy Church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the full confidence of the children of God, let us join together in a prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Amen. The body of Christ, given for us. The blood of Christ, given for us. The table is now prepared. I invite the ushers to come forward.
the body of Christ given for us. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. By the riches of your glory, may we be strengthened in our inner being. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite us to stand as we're able for our closing hymn, Come Ye Sinners Poor and Needy, to be found in the hymnal on 340.
May the love of the Father enfold us, the wisdom of the Son enlighten us, the fire of the Spirit kindle us, and may the blessing of the Lord God come down upon us and remain with us always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Blessed be thy